So let's take a little bit of time for reflection. For It doesn't have to be a Q&A. You don't have to ask questions. You can just state whatever it is that you would like to share. Oh, the author is Terry LePage, T-E-R-R-Y LePage, L-E-P-A-G-E, Eye of the Storm Facing Climate and Social Chaos with Calm and Courage. And I will probably, the, 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 the free audiobook version of it, because she's going to actually be making my audio version available for free, uh, will probably be available in three weeks or so. It'll probably take me close to a week to record it. Cool. I can't wait. So when you have comment, let, let Sue or I get to you with the, with the microphone. Say your whole comment. So John, I get John first. Thank you, Reverend Down. I think mainly because of you and your writings and other speeches that I've heard you give, I think I'm in post-doom. I know I'm more calm about the fate of planet Earth because of you. Thank you. But where I struggle is my grandchildren, and Ruth and I are lucky enough to have a great-grandchild already, that's where I can't be calm. So I feel what you say, John, because we're living close to our three-year-old granddaughter. And literally two days ago, we learned that our soon-to-be 13-year-old granddaughter is moving from Houston, Texas with her father to Washtenaw County, to Ann Arbor. So we'll be having both granddaughters living close by. What I all I'll do is share what I find helpful. If I expect that every person who's born has a right to live to the age of 70 or 80, I'm going to torture myself because I don't think there's likely to be anything larger than this, a mammal, any mammals larger than this that can burrow in the ground within the next 50 years, much less that any offspring of mine will last. I think things are wigging out that rapidly. But if I remind myself that children are not, they don't carry all the baggage that we do. A child just is present to their world, and as long as we adults aren't toxifying them with our guilt and our anger and our all the rest of that depression, kids are just present. Like, they live in that place of, okay, here's what's real, now what's possible? I honestly don't expect my three-year-old granddaughter to live to be one-third my age, but I think she can have the most awesome life possible as long as she's alive. And I think that's true for all of our children and grandchildren. Yeah, thank you so much for the peace that... Um, the last time you were here was the first time I heard you, and it, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, I appreciate the clarity with which you speak and the message that you brought to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Just a little living example of being the calm in the storm. My friend and I got caught at the Greater Flood Art Council Friday night in the storm. We had the, at the flood warnings and all. And oh my, how special it is to be caught with strangers. And it's such a cross-section of Flint at these events. Do talk to strangers. There was music, there was food, there was wine, there was, we danced with children, we talked with strangers, we watched the power of the wind through the huge plate, the rain through the plate glass windows. And we received a ride blocks away to our car by a wonderful stranger. So, yes, look for it. Look for the joy. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, can you give me a couple words that trump the second law of thermodynamics? Uh, can I give you anything that trumps the second law of thermodynamics? No, I can't. Why, I don't even know why I would try. For me, the second law of thermodynamics is one of the laws of God, one of the laws of life. 
Oh, the, oh the, 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 second, the second law of thermodynamics is that things run down. That, 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 that in natural systems, things, you know, energy becomes less and less useful as it's used over time. And life has this amazing property of actually creating complexity within that context, but it never is eternal. It's never everlasting. We've had a number of extinctions on this planet, and it always is a major setback to complexity because that's just the way life is. But again, when we accept that kind of thing, not as like something's wrong, but that, oh, yes, this is one of the laws of God, one of the laws of nature. This is just the way things are. Then that allows us to be with it from a place of gratitude for the time that we have and then finding ways of seeing who's in breakdown further along than I am, who's in collapse further along than we are, and then finding ways to contribute to them. Yes. I'd just like to thank you to Bonnie Gid for um, your message. It really um, meant a lot to me, and it helps create a kind of bigger picture, larger framework. Oh, I heard your previous um, talk to our congregation uh, online, uh, not in person, so I'm here today uh, in person. Uh, but you know, your messages helped me um, as a retired person to. And I think about the big picture and to put things in perspective. So just like Bonnie, I just want to express my gratitude to you for what, you, what you've given me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, one of the things that I do recommend is my post-doom website. It's just postdoom.com. There are three main pages. One is the page of conversations. I've had like 90 post-doom conversations with some of the leading people and the most inspiring examples and exemplars around the world of people of all ages who get the big picture so they have clarity, in most cases have gotten over the resentment and judgment and blame, and so they live in compassion, and then find that place of creative, courageous, and calm contribution in their own communities. So there's 90 post conversations. That's one of the pages on the post website. Another one is the resources. Like, if you want to learn this stuff and find out, like, this, is Michael Dow just talking out his butt? Is he really, is this really the way evolution is? And is this really the way that, um, that history is? Like, can I take his word on that? Or, or maybe, what would I read or listen to? Because I've recorded, like, two dozen books and like a hundred articles of the best of the best. You could call it deep sustainability scripture. The most inspiring writings on all of this stuff I talk about. And so you can listen to them for free. They're all freely available. And then the other, and, 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 and my best videos and the best videos that I've become aware of that others have created. So that's on the resources page of the post Dune website. And then the connect page is where the discussion forums, we have Zoom calls where there's 20 or 30 people on a Zoom call, and there's nothing like being able to communicate with others who share your heart and your values, whether they live local or not. Some of these people are all over the world. Because it, as most of us know, many of our friends and family, we can't be fully authentic about this stuff with because they go into freak out or, I don't want to hear this. Understandably. In fact, what I would say is that denial is so instinctual, so normal, so natural, so healthy that anybody in your life that doesn't want to hear about anything of the kind that, that I'm talking about, just love them exactly as they are and exactly as they're not and don't try to convince them of anything. Oh, another way to guarantee that you, are not, you will not be the calm in the storm is to make sure you read as much news as possible. And especially, don't read the people that that group considers news, because they're evil. Just read your side of things, right? I guarantee to make you miserable, and you won't be the eye of the, the, the column. Yeah. Oh, thanks for your message. Uh, very, very thought-provoking, Michael. And it occurred to me that it seems like we live in a time when no matter what a person's politics might be or their religion, that it's uncool not to be angry, and fearful, and maybe overreact at times, that it's like everywhere, that, that we're united by this idea that if you're a thinking person that you should be really angry and really fearful. Uh, do you encounter that a lot, and uh, is there a way of convincing people? I, I think your uh, message is very convincing that the way, if there's a way of being helpful at all, and a way out of this at all, 
uh, or not, is to be the calm at the center of the storm, but that everyone thinks that that's uncool, that you're yeah. bad. That is so profound, Jerry. Uh, no, seriously, that, I mean, I, 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 I hadn't had that thought, but the way you just articulated that, you're right. You know, our brains, the way our primate hominid human brains work is we sort for in-group and out-group. And so if you're in-group, are other activists and environmentalists and people who are just have been in the struggle for a long time to right injustices, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, any kind of injustice, right? There's, there's almost a badge of honor in being outraged, in being angry. And so if you're too calm or too accepting, you might risk not being perceived as in-group with them anymore. This is very interesting. What I would encourage, they're on the Connect page of the Postum website. I have several sermons. In fact, I think I have the sermon that I did here uh, back a year and a half, two years ago, whenever it was. But I, I think I've got that video, that the, and I've got four others that are short. In other words, they're like a half hour or less. And they're specifically the ones that I recommend or at least suggest that you watch and then see if your mother or your son or your neighbor or your Aunt Carrie or whoever, somebody in your life who you've been in a little bit of conversation with this, you sense a little bit of openness or receptivity, but not large. Allow me to try to break the ice for you. In other words, these short videos are often, and, and in fact, what I encourage you to do, I mean, if you're led to do this, obviously, but is to say something like, you know, I just heard this guy, this preacher came the other day and he talked about this, and I don't know whether this is your cup of tea or not, but, um, but if, if, you know, if you want to, I think this would be an interesting thing that we could discuss if you're interested in watching this. Just something where you're not trying to get them to watch something, where you just put it out there and say, you know, this may not be your cup of tea, but, you know, it's something that I'm in a conversation about these days, and I'm finding it helpful with others. So there's a, a comment from online from David. So in the early part of the talk, the clarification of a contraction phase for, rather than collapse. One wants to avoid catastrophic thinking when it is not necessary, although it is clear that, objectively speaking, conditions will change in ways that are not to our advantage. Yes, no, exactly. And the reason that I, I, I personally feel very comfortable with collapse because what I'm meaning is I've been studying for the last decade the collapse of ecosystems. And they're never like a building. It's a stair step. And there's partial recovery sometimes. That's the way that civilizations typically collapse. That's the way that ecosystems typically collapse. For example, Connie and I were staying in Humboldt County for a while. And these amazing redwoods, some of the most majestic you know, trees on the planet. But if you have the eyes of ecosystem collapse, you realize that some of these, many of these, these forests are in collapse. That is the only trees, the only redwood trees that are producing cones, that are producing babies, are those that are artificially watered. Because over the last 25 or 30 years, there's less fog and there's less rain. And so these trees are in a dying phase. They're in a contraction phase. But you won't know that unless you understand how ecosystems collapse. So yes, I prefer the term contraction in many cases because it doesn't have that knee-jerk reaction that people just like, collapse? Well, I don't want to hear about that. You know, whereas contraction is like, okay, I, I, it, there's not that immediate turnoff. I, I just last month turned 79. And um, I received a, a journal for my birthday, and in it, the person who gave it to me said, I hope you write some poetry or your thoughts in here. So the next day, I wrote a poem about what I hear you saying about that I am the matriarch of my family living into old age. Yes. And um, at the end, I say, I want to live these next few years well so that I could die well yes. when the time comes. Yes. Amen. And that's what a lot of us don't know because, again, we don't talk about death. We don't talk about the dying process in our civilization very much. And yet, you can be a profound example. It doesn't matter what your legacy has been for the last, you know, six or seven or eight decades. 
you can die well. And in that process of dying with grace, dying with dignity, dying with love, dying with trust, you can be an example to your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. You can be an example to others. So one of my favorite post-doom conversations that I've had, in fact, it's the very first one on the post-doom website. If you go there, the very first top left one is with Joanna Macy, one of my dear mentors and friends, and the title of it is To Collapse Well. So are you okay with me asking Connie a question? Of course. So Connie, can you tell me about um, this project that you're doing as you're saving the trees, please? Oh. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for asking that. So the main thing that I've gotten involved in, <clears throat> starting with an endangered species about 20 years ago, but now with everything, is that if you love any aspect of nature, any tree that is not dispersed by the wind, okay, these cottonwoods right out here, they don't need any help. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go. Um, but the oak trees, uh, the pines, virtually everything else <clears throat> during times of, of climate change have had a lot more time to be able to walk slowly north and south and north and south. As a glacier. As a glacier, especially here in the eastern USA. And we don't have that now. The oaks were also helped by the passenger pigeon enormously, but they've gone extinct. And so really, the wonderful thing Michael mentioned, to do something because it's the right thing to do and you don't have to know that you're, it's going to be good, I plant seeds all the time. And I will never know if what I'm doing is going to make a difference for this species to be able to make it decades, centuries, millennia into the future as climate changes. I will never know that. So I'll never know that I've failed. It's <laughs> fabulous. And, and I've got to say, this year is incredible because this is the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, 2023. And so the Associated Press, the New York Times Magazine, uh, Dan Rather's organization, 60 Minutes. I mean, these major national uh, journal, you know, journalistic outlets are doing specials on assisted migration. And, that, and so they're contacting, inevitably, they come and contact Connie. So just about a month and a half ago, two months ago, we had three documentarians, women, who showed up and spent three days with us videotaping everything. I mean, they got me and Connie walking to the cemetery because Connie had buried about 500 seeds in the previous fall. And so we were going to dig these up there. It's called winter stratified. So some of these seeds have to stay in the ground for a winter before they're going to germinate. So here we are walking to the cemetery. They've got a pickup truck. So they've got this like professional TV camera that they're doing this thing. And, and I've got a shovel over and we're just walking to the cemetery. And they did this for three days. They, they were up in the tree on a ladder getting Connie digging out the seeds. And then they put a camera under the soil so you could have a seed's eye view of being uncovered. <laughs> It was like I'd never experienced anything like this. And then my daughter, our daughter and granddaughter, drove their bicycle up, and they got a chance to see these t this TV crew and everybody, all the lights and everything else, and they're interviewing Connie. And my granddaughter and my daughter had never realized that in the field of assisted migration, she's a rock star. <laughs> and it like it, all of a sudden, Grandma Connie was like, "Whoa, check this out!" You know, so oh, where the seeds go? Yeah. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you for asking that question because this year the seeds went to three tribes, north, uh, northern Wisconsin, uh, up northeast of Traverse City, and then right next to, uh, through Robin Wall Kimmerer, the Onondaga Nation next to her near Syracuse, New York. These were our pawpaw seeds from southern Michigan, grown in orchards, 
And after a you pick time, I went to the orchard and I got the rotten ones, got the seeds, buried them in the cemetery. They have to stratify for one winter, dug them up, sent them to the three different tribes. Comment. Yeah. Unrelated to trees, because you know I can never stay on topic. Um, talking about the rise, the fall and rise of society. Of course, it's an old science fiction novel. Uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation, and he he is an inspiration to me because he, in, in his fictional character foresees the fall of this galactic wide civilization, and he plans what's going to happen next. And he says that, well, it, it, his idea is to shorten up how long the interregnum is. But, it, you know, here's an example of looking forward and say, what can I do yeah. for the rise again? And I'm a reckless optimist. You're not seeing a rise. I'm going to believe in a rise right up until somebody proves I'm wrong. Well, there, there will be. It just may not include humans. Oh, I, oh. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like that, kind of like that old saying, you know, is there hope? Yeah, there's hope. Not for us. But. <laughs> Well, I, again, I'm a reckless optimist. I'm going to continue That's, to hope, believe in us, and hope up right up until I'm proven wrong. You go for it, And baby. maybe not even then. <laughs> you go for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just quickly before we close. Um, a number of uh, the members of this congregation are very interested uh, in this thing called progressive Christianity. And we read the manifesto or the principles, whatever you call them, and, and we think, we could have written those at coffee hour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so we're right. very interested in that, and we're wondering what would your advice be to, a, to UU congregations that are not horrified by the word Christianity because we've studied what progressive Christianity is. Any words of advice going forward uh, yeah, for no, us? Great, great question. I actually just literally a month ago, uh, three and a half weeks ago, I had my latest article published. Uh, since my book, my book was written in 2007. So the only things of really substance, the, the things I'm really proud of that I've written in the last, say, 12, 13 years have been written for largely progressive Christian audiences. Four of the last six things that I published were published by the group called Progressive Christianity. They also have a website called Progressing Spirit. So, so um, I, I will send you the email that, that has the links because I've got those articles on my website. But yes, I mean, I've, as many of you, I'm sure most of you have probably heard, the United Church of Christ, which tends to be largely progressive, not entirely, there are some very conservative UCC churches, but largely they're not. And sometimes UCC is often referred to humorously as Unitarians considering Christ. So, you know. <laughs> but yes, the the... the that now, of course, the challenge, the challenge is the word progressive itself, because the word progressive implies a belief in progress. And that's one of the things that's actually collapsing, is the recognition that progress has never in human history been eternal. There's progress, and then there's regress. There's progress, and there's regress. And so... I did two sermons that you can find on my, on my YouTube channel, which is the great story, uh, called Confessions of a Recovering Progressive. And I still have progressive values, obviously. But having the expectation of perpetual progress is likely to cause uh, greater frustration. Because in times of expansion, when there's more than enough resources, more than enough energy, when there's economic growth, the pie gets bigger. Liberal values and progressive values predominate. But when the pie is getting smaller, when we've had, when we're past, when we're post peak in terms of energy and resources and things are in contraction, conservative values tend to predominate. That doesn't mean that those of us that aren't committed to progressive values shouldn't do all we can to see them into the future. We should. It's just not going to be easy. And if we expect that, then we're not going to be frustrated by it. Unless there are other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and have Michael uh, deliver some uh, closing words, and then we'll extinguish the chalice and do the prelude. May we leave this place embodying the very best of the liberal tradition, the very best of the progressive tradition, the very best of the Unitarian Universalist tradition, celebrating our differences, 
and being a blessing or attempting to be a blessing to all those with whom we come into contact in a way that is also a blessing to the future. Amen. Aho and blessed be.